Thank you for joining us for our webinar on how to teach Cambridge International AS and A-level psychology today. I'm Tamsin Hart from Cambridge University Press, and I'll be hosting this webinar for our speaker, Lizzie Gauntlet. While we wait for more attendees to join, let me explain how we're going to run the webinar. We're recording the webinar today to share with you afterwards. So don't worry if your internet drops out, just rejoin us when you can. If you're having trouble with your speakers, we suggest using headphones or checking that your speaker isn't muted. Your microphones will remain muted throughout the webinar. As I said, if you have any technical issues or questions about our psychology products, please can you put those in the chat box and my colleagues will be on hand to help you. You can see um, Laura's there, Megan's there, and we have Karis as well. Please can you put any questions for our speaker into the Q&A box and our speaker Lizzie will answer those at the end of the webinar. Seven days after the webinar, we'll send you an email thanking you for your attendance with a link to the webinar recording and information on where to find the webinar slides. Unfortunately, we can't provide certificates. However, you can use this email as proof of your attendance. Welcome to everyone joining us today. It's great to see you all coming online. Okie dokes, that is the end of our introduction. Thank you very much for joining the webinar. Now over to Lizzie. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's really exciting for me to be here and to know that so many of you have chosen to join us and find out more about the new syllabus and how all the Cambridge resources can support your teaching and learning. So I'm just going to start off the session by telling you a bit about myself. Um, I'm one of several authors um, on the team that have produced uh, these three resources. I'm an experienced former teacher and head of department for psychology, so I've got experience across level two and three GCSE and A-level. Uh, I've written a number of psychology resources and other teaching resources, um, both for further education and higher education. Uh, I'm also an experienced examiner. I've been examining for, I think, nearly 10 years now um, in various roles. And um, my area of research is psychology and education. Um, that's the area my PhD was conducted in, but I'm have continued research interests in social psychology, of course, teaching and learning at further and higher education. And um, my specialism is in qualitative, qualitative research methodologies. So just to tell you a bit about um, what we're going to do today, our aims and objectives for the session. Um, you know, I really want all you who teachers who've given up your time today to get the most that you can out of this session. Um, and I know that our, our time is kind of precious. Um, so ideally, I want you to leave feeling a bit more confident about the syllabus, maybe with some ideas of how you can embed some of the Cambridge principles in your teaching and uh, and certainly an idea of how all three resources can support your teaching and learning. So in the session, I'm going to tell you a bit about strategies and approaches that I think would be useful for teaching successful psychology lessons, how each of our resources can support the syllabus changes that are coming and um, how they can enhance the learning of your students as well, get them really engaged. So after um, I've talked a bit about those strategies and Tamsin shared with us some images from the resources so you can get, a, get an idea of what they're going to look like, there'll be an opportunity for everyone to ask questions. I know that you'll be populating the, the Q&A box with those as we go. Um, if you just hover your pointer at the top or bottom of your screen, that Q&A box should pop up. OK, so um, first of all, thinking about introducing a new subject, I know some of you will already be delivering the current psychology Cambridge International syllabus to your learners. Some of you might be completely new to it, but obviously we're very much in the same position where we've got um, new content and new learners coming. So um, the three strategies I'm going to speak about today are firstly planning ahead. So getting familiar with those new studies. I know that's one of the first things that I look for when there's a new syllabus. What have they changed? What's the same? Um, what might the challenges I can anticipate be? 
Um, and also, is there any change to the level of detail? So whilst we're all eagle-eyed looking for these new things and additional content, um, I'm going to point out some of those changes later to you to hopefully get you a bit of a, a head start looking at those. Um, to be clear, Cambridge International have already provided a summary of what those changes are. And of course, we can all look at the new um, syllabus online itself. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is we have embedded within the course book um, checklists, and those are very comprehensive summaries of everything that you need to know on the syllabus. We've provided them at the end of each chapter, including the options chapters. So as well as planning ahead, I think it's a good chance for us to think about what we're already strong at, good at teaching, and what our learners already might be good at learning, I suppose, or what they might already know. So in terms of transferable skills and subject knowledge, um, yeah, it's a chance to ask yourself those questions. What will my learners already know? What are they likely to find really interesting? What do I know from my past experience that they might struggle with? You might also want to consider who your learners are. So what other subjects will they be studying? Will they have a background in maths and biology or be co-learning those at the same time? Um, will they have experience of practical investigations? Some of them may even have undertaken GCSE psychology. So with those things in mind, you can build on thinking about what their preconceptions and expectations of studying psychology might be. Um, in terms of linking to learner experience, the resource is great for that. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about um, how that's embedded in there. And Tamsin's gonna show you some examples of how you can consider your learner's existing experience and really bring that into the subject as well. And then finally, um, encouraging reflection. This isn't something that should just be an add-on. We think with the Cambridge principles that reflection, um, both on the part of our learners and us as teachers, should be uh, just part of our core practice, really. But I'm gonna talk a bit more in detail about that later on. Okay, so I'm gonna hand back to Tamsin now, and she's going to um, just talk to you a bit about how the resources are designed to support strategies for first teaching. Fabulous, you can see here on screen some examples from our resources. With the teaching a new subject support in the teacher's resource, this helps you support students as they encounter a new subject for the first time. The common misconceptions lists in the teacher's resource help you identify and overcome the challenges posed by misunderstandings. And across to the right, we have the introduction, learning intention and getting started features in the course book, which make learners aware of the learning intentions and required background knowledge before starting. And next slide, please. Okay, so thank you, Tamsin. As promised, I'm gonna come back to thinking about student reflection and what we call metacognition opportunities, how we can use those effectively in our teaching practice. So with these two terms, reflection and metacognition, um, we probably all have our own ideas and definitions of what they mean. But just to be clear about what I'm talking about, reflection is that broader process, looking back on our experiences. Um, so if you're the learner thinking about how they did on a certain task, why did they do it that way? What worked? What didn't work? Uh, whereas metacognition is a particular type of reflection where we're thinking about how we think. So although this might sound a bit um, navel gazing or unnecessary, I actually think it's really important for learners to get stronger at doing this um, because otherwise they're kind of the... Uh, the hamster going back to the electric cupcake over and over again, trying to attempt a task in a way that maybe isn't the most effective way for them. So it's getting them to ask themselves those questions. How is my planning going for this task? Um, am I on track? So we sometimes call that reflection in action when they're partway through what they're doing. You can ask them, how do you know that you're getting to where you need to be? Um, and also looking at the feedback they get. So whether you've done a peer assessment, self-assessment, or there's teacher guidance, um, get them to reflect on that feedback. What was the most helpful bit? What did I go straight to? What am I going to change next time? So um, I've given some examples here of how you might like to embed this in your practice. Um, and it's, it's something we can get really uh, routine at something we can we can do be doing every time we don't have to put aside a time for a special reflection 
Um, and you might realize that you're actually doing quite a bit of this already. So one example might be to get students to explain just in one sentence what they are asked to do in a task. So we would call that reflective planning. So they just echo back to you what they think they've been asked to do. This is an interesting one because sometimes I think as a teacher, I'm so clear in the, the guidance that I've given and what I've told them to do. And actually, you realize that they've, they've heard something quite different or they might have focused on something um, that actually isn't what you think is important about it. So that's a really good way to try and start off on the right foot. Um, checking in on the task, as I mentioned, if you've got students, maybe they're off doing some group work, get them to pause, get them to you know, stop what they're doing as you come around um, or go into their breakout room and you know, ask them, are there any areas that you're not sure about? What do you think is going to be challenging coming up? Did you get stuck on anything? Uh, and that really gets them to stop, check in and, and, and get clarification. And then lastly, post-task reflection. Um, again, this can be a really easy thing to do at the end of an activity if you've got a couple of minutes. Just get them to talk to their neighbour. It doesn't have to be formal feedback to use the teacher. Um, somebody sat next to them or, or maybe in the group chat. How well do they think their strategy for approaching that task worked? What could be improved? What would they change next time? So those are just a few of those examples. And Tamsin's now going to show you how we've embedded those within the resource. Um, kind of to make your job a bit easier and you can think about building in some reflective practice. Thank you, Lizzie. So we're looking here at peer and self-assessment opportunities. So at the end of some activities, your learners will find opportunities to help them assess their own work or their classmates and consider how they can improve the way that they learn. The summary checklists you can see to the left are followed by I can statements which correspond to the learning intentions at the beginning of the chapter. Your students can rate how confident they are for each of these statements when they're revising. They should revisit any topics that they rated needs more work or almost there. And above the reflection activities, they ask your learners to look back on the topics covered in the chapter and test how well they understand these topics and encourage them to reflect on their learning. And next slide, please. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, one of our kind of key areas to look at now is language support. And I know that I'm talking to um, attendees from a wide variety of countries here, some of whom English will be the first language of your learners. For, for many, it is likely to be second, third, you know, additional language. So I think it's important to consider in our teaching practice the use of language. Um, this is something that the authors and the production team at Cambridge University Press have given a lot of time and attention to when we've developed these resources. So if you're in an international centre, I think it's fair to say that you probably have a dual challenge when you're teaching psychology. We might be delivering to learners in English, as I said, that could be their second, third, fourth, fifth language even. Um, but the second part of that is also trying to introduce our learners to subject specific terminology, which obviously is a challenge for uh, native English speakers as well. So it's not necessarily things like key terms from the biological approach or heavy scientific language with which they won't be familiar with, which of course we, we know is a challenge and um, we've embedded things like that into our glossaries. But um, it's also trying to get learners to hear things for the first time, to become kind of fluent in the language of psychology, to practice those things, to, to you know, vocalize and, and speak those terms. So for example, in applied psychology, um, I know some of the language can be quite tricky. Um, I'm thinking particularly of consumer psychology. You get things like named selling techniques and, and some of those sound strange to native English speakers as well. You know, they, they certainly have their own kind of language there. So yes, we want learners to be confident in hearing, writing and speaking um, psychological terms. So here's some approaches um, which I've put on the slide. Uh, in terms of the challenging technical vocabulary, we've got to look out for those subtle differences. So anticipate things that your learners might you struggle with or, or confuse the terms. So for example, in social psychology and organizational psychology, we might use the terms intra and intergroup conflict or um, tensions and things like that. So 
there's very subtle differences, I think, to some learners approaching that for the first time. So my tip would be to try to anticipate and clarify what those ambiguous words or metaphors in the theories and studies from the syllabus might be. Um, and the other aspect of language that we're really keen to support is their mastery of command words. So those, those words that are used formally in the assessments and are specifically defined by um, Cambridge International Assessment, as well as the key terms which appear on the syllabus. And those key words do feature in the course book and the workbook before each exercise, um, which Tamsin's gonna show you in just a moment. And then lastly, um, I think a, one way we can really scaffold that support for learners um, is uh, providing sentence stems. Um, you know, you'll know the level of challenge that your learners are ready for, and um, we can actually use those things, for example, to structure an evaluative um, essay or task that you want them to complete. Um, so you can you can kind of get get them started and get them going until they're well practiced and well versed um, in psychological language. Okay, so over to you, Tamsin, just to illustrate some of those supportive language features. Thank you, Lizzie. Key vocabulary that you'll see is highlighted in the text when it's first introduced. Meanings are given in the feature boxes close where the word is highlighted. You'll also find definitions of these words in the glossary. And over to the right here, you'll see command words. They appear in the syllabus highlighted in practice questions where they're first introduced. In the margin, you'll find the Cambridge International definition. You'll also find these definitions in the glossary with some further explanation. And next slide, please. Illustrations and images throughout help explain key concepts and engage learners. And the language support boxes in the teacher's resource provide advice on how to support English as a second language learners for each topic. And next slide, please, Lizzie. Okay, thank you. All right, so moving on from language, one of the other key things that we know can be a challenge um, is teaching in a differentiated classroom. So um, I'm going to have a bit of interaction from you attendees now, hopefully. Um, I've put a couple of questions on the slide. So if you want to be thinking about these, about activities that you use to support some students and activities that can be used to stretch and challenge other students. And I've used the example of um, teaching the theory of classical conditioning, which is on the current spec and is also um, on the new syllabus as well. So I'll give you a bit of time to do that. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about differentiation and then maybe we can um, Hear, hear what's been pop popped in the chat for some ideas that have been shared. So what I would say about um, differentiation is kind of as we approach our planning, I know that we're really cognizant of the range of abilities of our learners um, and also their likes and dislikes. I think to me that comes into differentiation as well. How are they going to best engage with the materials and the tasks um, that I, I need them to use? So sometimes differentiation can feel like a bit of a tiring thing that we have to do, but I don't think it is a box ticking exercise. Um, so I think if we have any input from the chat now, maybe you have a chance now to share some, some activities that you could use to stretch and support students. We're just waiting for um, some answers to come into the chat. So okay. if I just encourage you to use the chat box and think about what activities would you use to support some students? If you want to put in something more generally, that's fine. But I, I think classical conditioning can be something that can be hard to engage learners with and some learners of lower ability might, might find that quite challenging. So that's why I've used that as a, as a bit of a hook for us. I think everyone's still thinking a little bit this morning <laughs> and this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Okay, all right. Well, um, we can move on from that. And if you Ooh, want to share... we have what we oh. have a couple of points coming through. Sorry oh, to timely. interrupt you, Lizzie. That's okay. So students designing their own examples of CC. Yes. And to stretch, I get mine to look up extra research. So where where did it originate from? And we've got role play as well. Role play is a really nice one. Yes, that's. Yeah, that can be very engaging. Yes, and some and, and using different examples. So I think um, quite a nice structured approach to it to support less able learners is um, to actually get them to write out their diagram and use their own activities or, or maybe you've you've made a suggestion of an example of classical conditioning. Or oh, why don't you, you know, do it with um, 
uh, disgust, for example, so something, a bad experience that might repel them, and then they have a bit of fun kind of um, putting that out, but in a structured, supportive way. That's nice. We've got some um, more coming through now. We've got okay. Milgram's movie, for example, to support the study from the book. Or for classical conditioning, I have a few video examples and actual experiments, like the lemonade on the tongue every time a bell is rung. They'll also salivate to a bell and cutouts of CS, NS, UCS, et cetera, with arrows and have them in groups that are differentiated. And they try to unshuffle and create the right structure, use different conditioning items. Oh, it's um, lots of things coming in now and time them to see if they can get faster. And I start conditioning my students early in the semester, greeting them with sour candy inside a toy castle. <laughs> When it comes time to teach CC, they are shown the castle without candy, not quite differentiation, but it works every time. Biological factors often a great equalizer. And then how about pre-teaching the vocabularies? Oh, those are so good. I love the fact that many of you have used this as an opportunity to train your students. I think that's very interesting. Um, and yes, what, what better way to kind of show them, but in action, how psychology is working. Those are really nice. And, um, and yes, the cut and sort, um, you know, that, that's really good. And actually picking up on the, um, in, you know, quite often learners are there being in a classroom or, or being together. They are often um, the best form of support for one another using that peer support is, um, is really good. It can stretch and challenge our able learners who are able to reinforce, you know, what they've known and understood because they're having to explain it. And of course, it's a, perhaps a, a bit of a lower threat exercise and having a teacher explain something to you again um, to, be, to be working with others, someone who's recently learned it. We all know about the zone of proximal development, so I won't <laughs> labour that too much. Thank you for your engagement with that. Okay, so moving on from um, this, I'm going to pass back to Tamsin now to have a look at how um, we, we tr try to support differentiation um, in the resources. Brilliant. Thank you, Lizzie. So we have projects that enable students to apply their learning from the whole chapter to group activities such as making posters or presentations or taking part in debates. They may also provide the opportunity to extend learning beyond the syllabus. And we've got project guidance and a teacher's resource that helps you support that project work. And at the bottom, you'll see a differentiation idea there. Now, these help you support and challenge learners on each topic or activity. And next slide, please, Lizzie. OK, thank you. All right. So another kind of key area, and I think this is really well emphasised in both the current syllabus, but we do have a lot of clarification coming through in the new syllabus about uh, research methods and how we can support the scientific skills development of our learners. So uh, the main skills that students must develop for the course are to describe, evaluate, compare and apply concepts in research methodology. And I think that bit about um, comparison um, has kind of come through a little bit more strongly um, in the revised syllabus. They of course need to plan their own research, which you'll be familiar with from the current um, syllabus, but there are some tweaks and updates to that. Uh, as always, data analysis, so being confident with data handling uh, and our key concepts, issues and debates, um, which you know feature as part of psychology being a, being a science. So um, as we touched on earlier, I suppose one surprise for learners is that when they approach psychology for the first time, they are not, don't always necessarily know that it is a science. And I see it very much as my job as a teacher to, to make sure that they do know and understand that um, because it it's, uh, comes with its own underlying concepts and principles. So that we must be rigorous, that we must use testable ideas. And of course, that everything we do is based on the consideration of empirical evidence. Um, so I've got some suggestions here for how to embed scientific skills into your lessons. I mean, I remember when I was taught psychology A-level, research methods particularly felt like it was a bit of a bolt on. In fact, I think we had it sort of last thing on a Friday afternoon for an hour. So it, it, it sat quite separately from um, the theories and, and studies that we were looking at otherwise. But actually, I, I don't think... Um, you know, I, I think we have moved on quite quite a lot from that. Um, 
because real psychology, and by that I mean the further study and the practice of psychology in the real world, is absolutely inextricable from um, methodology and from scientific principles. And because we want to kind of build the confidence of our learners and, and their scientific language, if you like, we want them to become fluent in um, conducting research and being critical about research. So here are some suggestions. Firstly, that each lesson, we should try to embed these skills, even if it's in just a very small way. Um, so we can include data tables, we can include uh, actual images from our core studies or images from the resource, um, you can look at the course book, you can see our uh, adapted tables and um, graphs, uh, which should be accessible for students to read. And you can ask them questions about them. So what would you say is one finding from the graph shown in, in this figure, for example? It's also really nice to get them to do their data analysis. Um, so you can give them um, tables from original studies or again from the resource just get them to work out some calculations um, so it, you know it can be linked to content or you might be getting them to do things um, where they've actually gone and done some of their own research as well on topic and that will get them to um, start thinking about why we do things and how we apply those um, uh, uh, data analysis methods also getting them to think about the types of measures and graphs you use. This is something I find that many students struggle with, um, understanding what type of measure of average is appropriate to use, depending on the type of data they've collected or um, the type of graphical representation. So I just think, you know, we're not really doing them any favors by shying away from that. And as much as we can, you know, seize little opportunities, just a little bit each time, what can you tell me about the, the table? How would we find the median? Um, even if you're trying to plow through content, I think it's so worthwhile, um, you know, just making an opportunity for that. Builds their confidence bit by bit. Okay, second point, um, get them to try and compare and contrast different methods. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yes, for example, um, laboratory versus field experiments. Again, um, comparison is something that is quite, you know, quite clear in the new syllabus that they have to be able to do. And um, again, just asking a few probing questions about that or, or getting them to do some tasks around comparison of different methods, um, different sampling methods, um, those sorts of things can be a, a really easy way of embedding that. And then I suppose this one links to the differentiation um, that we talked about, but actually I would argue that even students who are, you know, perhaps on the lower ability end of the scale for psychology, um, trust them, get them to look at an academic paper. You know, you, you could be selective about which one you use. Um, you, you might find some more accessible than others. Um, and it's tricky, you know, some of the older papers look like they should be more accessible, but actually they're not necessarily written in a way that's accessible for, for learners. So, you know, you'll, you'll be familiar with those. They're all freely available. Um, Cambridge International has a resource list so you can click through um, to read all of them. But just get them to have a feel for it. What are even just breaking it down? What are the different sections? Oh, the discussion comes at the end. Why is that? What would be involved in that? Okay, or oh, it's about comparing their results to the existing research. Okay, you know, actually seeing um, what's talked about in the material section or um, uh, what, what um, type of experimental design has been used. So, you know, you can set them tasks to do on the academic paper that are kind of high challenge and low threat in that way so if you give them nice structured questions they'll feel pretty good about you know oh, I read an academic paper today I found the information that I needed from that um, and yeah it's all about just building that fluency I think with um, scientific reporting oops sorry <laughs> skipped on there so um if we can have any thoughts in the chat just about this, um, I know it's an area of challenge. So question to you attendees, what are some of your challenges for with students who are trying to plan their studies? Um, and what strategies do you use to help them plan their studies? I'll just give you a sort of a minute or two to feedback we, on that. We have a point that has come in already. Um, 
um, Michael here teaches social psychology first and then research method methods. He finds um, research methods too abstract for them at first. And it's nice to use examples from the social experiments they've already learned when teaching samples, methods, IV versus DV, data, et cetera, makes it more concrete for them. I think that's great. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at really. Um, rather than being a bolt on, as you say, Michael, which is, can be very abstract for them and, and not meaningful, going back to those studies, um, really, really important, yeah. If anyone else would like to add anything to the chat, we are ready and waiting. That's it for the moment, Lizzie. Okay, if you think of anything else um, and you want to share them, please, um, you know, pop them in the chat partway through and we can always return to them Ooh. in the discussion. We have a, a few more that have come in now, Great. fantastic. I teach AS a level psychology. I have them make a portfolio, which eventually becomes their best study tool. I divide the portfolio into research first, then the 12 course studies. And we have an agreement with Michael here. Having ESL students in China makes research methods very abstract. So also teach one approach first, then highlight the research method, method within the content. Later, I also use the original study papers and have them look at the data and the processes and share. Great. Yeah, I, I, I really like those, the idea of the portfolio and organization because it's so, um, and, and highlighting which bits of research methods, because I think for those learners who lack confidence, they probably don't know how much they already know and have learned or, or maybe are starting to get an insight to. So that's, it's a good confidence building exercise as well. And then one more has come through um, from Haley. As we go through each study, I always get them to review which method and what the advantages, disadvantages are. So um, sampling slash design, etc. cetera. Great, and an, yes. An, and another one, I teach AS psychology, but I always start with research methods to get the student familiar with it. Yeah, that's, that's a nice, that's a hardcore approach. But actually, as I said, I think that is really important because it sets our students expectations about what psychology is straight away and, um, and kind of, um, uh, yeah, challenges any preconceptions. Oh, I thought it was just going to be about, you know, Freud or thinking about dreams or, you know, some of those perhaps cliche ideas that they might have. So. Oh, and some more have come through. Um, I teach research methods first. It gives the students the knowledge on what to look for in the reviewing of the course studies. And I find teaching IGCSE sociology really helps prepare them for research methods. And one last one here, teenagers tend not to have great organizational skills. I make it a requirement. After we learn research methods, we apply it to all the course studies. Yes, great, yeah, exactly. So it's that fluency, it's that rehearsal, isn't it? Um, yeah, we, we almost can't overdo it with that. That's great. Okay, I'm just gonna move on now. And um, Tamsin's just gonna show you a couple of ways that we've built some of those skills and methods we've just spoken about into the resources. Lovely, thank you, Lizzie. Here you'll see the teaching skills focus boxes in the teacher's resource, which support the application of different learning, learning and teaching approaches, helping you develop learner skills. And here the research methods boxes detail the research methods that relate to the content in each topic. Thank you, Lizzie. Yes, that's, that's quite apt really, because talking about those cross-curricular um, links, like you just spoke about the IGCC and sociology, um, yeah, re, you know, they don't realize how much they know, how much can be applied. And, and it does, um, it kind of excites the brain, doesn't it, to make those things. Okay, so talking now, we're going to think about using diagnostic questions. So questioning something that um, you know often comes up, and, and teachers want to be better questioners. Um, and I think we can use those to also challenge some of the misconceptions that I spoke about earlier. So, um, what do we mean by um, diagnostic questions? So, these are questions that we would use to help us understand students' current level of knowledge. Um, or skill um, when they're starting a new topic. So we could use those when students are, for example, on the syllabus, they have to plan their own research or, or write about how they would plan their research. Um, you know, get them to think about what is that key difference between an experiment and a correlation? Because, you know, that can be a real pitfall um, for students when they come to write essays, um, you know, when they have to plan, it, plan
plan, they've been asked to plan an experiment, but actually they've done something correlational or quite often it's, it's the other way around and, and they've misunderstood. Um, so yeah. Oh, right. Oh yes, of course. It's about causation. You can't have causation in a correlate. So just get them off on the right foot, really. That, that's a good way to, um, to start some questions. So second point, um, establishing what their mistakes or misconceptions are and, and kind of making up the, those safe to do, you know, oh, I thought it, you know, I thought it was this. So focusing on subject specific knowledge. Um, so again, for those learners, you might know some of them are doing biology. Can you explain how the term diffusion is used in biology versus social psychology? Well, actually, as psychology teachers, we know that it, it, it's kind of used in a quite a similar way. So actually, there's, there's no wrong answer there. So find out what their beliefs are you know head off any mistakes but making the classroom or the virtual environment somewhere that's safe to, to make those mistakes and there's no kind of wrong answers really we're, we're looking to get them on the right track and support them okay and then lastly I suppose when we've finished teaching a piece of content um, identifying areas that you need to go back and review with students it's an inevitable part of teaching and getting the learners to where they need to be so for example if you're um, helping their students to prepare for an assessment so during a revision period you might want to focus on um, teaching command words or getting them to to understand what those command words mean um, so do they know what the command word analyze means how would that look like um, sorry, how would that look in a good response? How would a good response look like um, uh, if that, that was, you know, requiring them to write about it? Um, so, yes, I'm saying I guess you can use them for um, preparation for the exam as well. Um, I think it's just important to notice that, you know, effective questioning for teachers, it's sort of our weapon of choice, really. Um, you know, the way we talk to our learners, the things we ask them, we can understand what's understood. Um, and, and misunderstood so I don't I, you know it's probably something that you're all very skilled at but I think it's worth us reflecting on how we're doing it and how we can do it better so um, Tamsin's now going to show you how we've kind of done both those things preempted some common misconceptions and the features of the resources that can head those off um, and get things on the right track when we're introducing the new topics thank you Lizzie Okay, so on the left here, we have background knowledge boxes, which remind you about what you should know before teaching a topic. And then we've got the common misconceptions tables again in the teacher's resource, which help you to work with learner misunderstandings. And getting started boxes, which contain questions and activities on required subject knowledge before starting each chapter. Thank you, Lizzie. Okay, so... Um... What I would say about um, kind of coming coming to the end of the things that I've got to say about our different strategies, um, we as the author team for these resources, we've really done our best to design questions and activities to meet a range of different purposes. Um, we know that you'll want to use them in lots of different ways, whether it is to see where you're at, whether it's to prepare for assessment, whether it's to get students to think and dig a bit deeper about a topic. Um, so I like to think that we've kind of, throughout the three resources, developed kind of an arsenal of, of, of different um, uh, questions and activities that you can pick and choose from um, to kind of suit your needs. So um, we've got some that are designed for knowledge acquisition. So these are the little pop-out activity boxes in the coursework, for example. And really, those are just designed to enable the students to extract and process information um, from the text as they're reading it or from the teaching and learning that they've just engaged with. So that's, that's the knowledge acquisition part. Uh, next, we want to consolidate. Yeah, so we've got short response questions that appear at the end of each of the subtopics in the course book. So they, they're kind of broken down by studies or broken down by subject areas and the options. And those really provide an opportunity for students to review their understanding. And obviously as a check-in point for us as teachers, we can see um, you know, where they're at and, and what they have and haven't understood. And then um, I suppose um, as, as um, perhaps even summative assessment um, in, in some cases, uh, the, the questions and activities can be used as a form of uh, classroom-based assessment. So there's 
fuller practice questions that appear in the course book and they will assess the student progress. Um, you can use them in class, you can use them as homework, you can use them as, um, you know, preparation. Um, and uh, there's lots of suggestions for how you can do that as peer assessment or as self-assessment. It doesn't all have to be, um, you know, teacher led or teacher assessed. Um, and we've separated out the answers for those. Those appear in the teacher's resource. So again, um, you can either use that for the learners to peer assess, self-assess against, or you've already got um, you know, sample answers um, to use and, and, and to know um, how you're going to be marking those responses really. Uh, okay, so Tams is now gonna show you some of the screen grabs of the resources that I've just spoken about um, that illustrate those. Lovely, thank you, Lizzie. Here we've got very practice questions with command words in context in the text, which give, which give the students opportunity to prepare for assessment. And the learning plan in the teacher's resource, which aligns learning intentions with success criteria for each topic. Thank you, Lizzie. Okay, that's great, thank you. Okay, so I just want to finish up with the next couple of slides, which regard um, what I view as some kind of key changes to the syllabus, um, just, to, just to highlight to you really, but um, as I said, full details of all the changes to the syllabus can be found in the up updated version, which is on the Cambridge Assessment International Education website. Um, and obviously, I know some of you might be entirely new to teaching psychology or psychology, you know, this, this specification coming. So, um, you, you kind of won't know what you didn't know, but I, you know that these are kind of important changes um, for our students and for us as teachers. So firstly, the updated syllabus, you'll notice that there are new materials, there's new requirements, both for AS and A-level. So in the AS section, five of the core studies have been replaced across um, the different approaches. Uh, there's a reduction in the number of A-level studies that the learners must know. So there's one per subtopic, which makes five per option. Um, and I actually, I think what's really helpful is there's greater clarity on the level of detail that's required for each. Um, I, th I think this is, um, is something that will help us. Uh, the course book. So our course book uh, will include the detailed summaries of each of the course studies um, and the key studies as they're um, term to A-level and um, so it's a nice way for teachers to you know introduce you to the study um, before you can access the or before you access the full articles online. Um, so yes in the A-level section the relevant issues and debates and methodology are indicated now at the end of each subtopic. I think again really helpful. Um, some of them will probably you know you could work out which ones would apply to the different topics but I think um, just by making that explicit, it, it's helpful for us um, when we're teaching the issues and debates. Uh, the course book to reflect that includes a discussion after each subtopic. Um, and there's a wealth of kind of activities and questions that will provide checks on understanding um, for those issues, issues and debates in the options section. You'll notice also that the research method, method section at AS has been reorganized. And then what you've got separated out is the additional content uh, for A-level. So what we've tried to do in the course book is really carefully map the content of the course book to the new structure of the syllabus. So there's a range of activities to support the new teaching content. And then finally, the specialist options um, have been retitled. So you'll notice that they've been updated um, using the language that we would currently use. Um, and uh, so my example of that was psychology and abnormality as it is now has been retitled clinical psychology. Uh, and research methods content has also been reviewed, as I've mentioned. Um, you'll notice another key change for those of you, I know a lot, lot of um, centres do teach um, clinical psychology or abnormality as it is now. Um, the ICD-11 is replacing um, DSM as the classification system to kind of reflect that um, international um, nature of the A-level. This is all explained in the syllabus anyway. I just, for, for me, these are some big changes. Um, so what we've done to kind of um, reflect that in the course book, we've got a full content checklist for each unit of the syllabus. And um, we've also incorporated teaching plans, um, detailed teaching plans within the teacher's resource. So all of those should help you to understand and prepare for those changes. 
Okay, um, so I think that's it. I'm going to hand back now to Tanzan, if that's okay. Thank you so much for listening um, um, to those um, tips and strategies. I hope they've been a bit of help. Fantastic. Thank you so much for everyone and your interactivity today. And thank you for a fantastic presentation, Lizzie. Just before we start the q and I am going to launch a poll because we'd be really interested to find out about your main teaching challenges at the moment. So I'm just going to pop that up on screen and give you a few moments to answer that. But I will share all the results with you afterwards because it'd be good to see how our teaching challenges compare. And while you're filling that in, you can also think about any questions that you'd like to put into the Q&A box. For any syllabus questions, we recommend you go to Cambridge International and also any assessment questions, but we can answer other pedagogical points and questions about our resources. Brilliant, I'm seeing lots of answers coming in here. I'm just going to give you some more time to fill that out. But thank you everyone for joining us today. We've really appreciated you giving us your time. And we hope we've helped with some of your teaching challenges along the way. Oh, we've got 67% response rate here. This is looking very good and that's rising up to 69. Into the 70s now. even more, heading towards 80. Let's see if we can make it to 80. <laughs> I think we're stabilizing out there. I'm gonna give you one more second to pop your responses in, but otherwise I'm going to end the poll there and share the results. So I think that's interesting spread. It's pretty well spread, isn't it? I mean, we've got a lead on preparing my students for assessment, that's one of the higher challenges, followed by English as a second language learners, then applying effective approaches. And then interestingly, what's your current teaching situation? The highest out of those back in the classroom, but we're still having a blend and we're still having completely online as well. Brilliant, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okie dokes, now it's time for your questions. Let's see what we've got in the Q&A box. So our first question. Now, some of these questions, I'm gonna read them out, but we might have to pass them on to Cambridge International. Um, so we've got, just to clarify, students who sit paper one and paper two in summer 2023, AS students starting in September, 2022, will sit paper one and paper two based on the current syllabus and when they sit paper three and paper four in summer 2024, this will also follow the current syllabus. Would we like to answer that or pass that on, Lizzie? I think you would need to check that with the, there's a good section in the qualification um, specification on, on that, but I wouldn't be confident answering. Um, all I can say is the first teaching. Fantastic. We're going to yeah, pass that on to Cambridge International. Yeah, I think my, my colleagues um, in the chat will just pop the link to the Cambridge International site so you can find that easily. Now, regarding the resource book you recommend, does it include the PDF original doc for the new course studies? Um, no, it doesn't. Yeah, so the original studies, there is a published resource list so you should be able to access those all online but just because of the extent of them that would be too much to um, contain within the course book so what we've provided is very detailed summaries of those um, course studies fantastic thank you lizzie and then what do we have here ah i think this is a question that i can ask from uh, answer rather from tamika can you explain the differences between the different teacher resources access card versus digital resource is there an example of the workbook so um, my colleagues are going to stick in the chat a link to the website where you can see um, the workbook online there and you will also be able to see the um 
inside sample of that book, so give you all the examples. But to answer the question about the teacher's resource, access card versus digital resource. So you either get an access card where you receive your code to access your digital re resource on a card, or you get it in an email. So that is the only difference. It's just um, a different delivery method. And next, let's see. I see that there are two different resources. Which is the most recommended? I love the idea of having a textbook as well as a workbook. My students have difficulty with online resources. Um, so Lizzie, um, we've obviously got the, um, we've got the print and digital bundle of the course book, or we've got the digital on its own. And then we have the workbook. Would you be able to explain um, what benefits the workbook brings the learner? Yes, of course. Well, obviously the course book very much is the textbook and that contains uh, the summaries and it does have some activities and questions in it as well, which we hope would be very useful in the main. The workbook is really um, very structured exercises which are mapped onto um, each of the topics um, and options. So um, it, it's quite often scaffolded. So there's some simpler exercises which are just based around knowledge acquisition so it might be you know fill in the blank exercises or matching exercises but then there's much uh, more challenging ones as well so it's sort of you know a, a real mix of activities that are in there um, so yes and it is designed for students to be able to, to work through brilliant thank you lizzie now we've got another question um sometimes topics in a levels do not come with prescribed research to, to support certain ideas, e.g. possible biological causes for OCD or causes of group conflict. Therefore, textbooks differ on resources for these sections. To what extent will be this, this be the case with the new syllabus? Should teachers choose their own empirical support for the more theoretical sections so that students can support their claims? Yes, my answer to that would be yes. I think the syllabus is really clear when it wants you to use, when you must use a study or when you must use a theory. And it is now quite explicitly clear when it says an example would be, um, you don't have to use that example, you could use your own. Um, and if one isn't specified, then any legitimate theory or research, um, you know, that, that would be the thing to teach your learners. That's, yeah, in, in my view. Brilliant. Thank you, Lizzie. And now we have a question. Oh, fantastic. We love questions like this. How can I know about the webinars of teaching other subjects? Um, it's great that you've shown interest. Thank you. Um, when you signed up to this webinar, if you registered to, to receive marketing emails, then we will keep in touch with you with information, more information about psychology content. If you'd like to know about other subjects, you can go to our website and sign up for our e-newsletter and make sure you've selected those other subjects when you sign up and um, refine your answers. And then we will stay in touch with you and let you know about the wonderful webinars that are coming up because we have tons of webinars coming up for different subjects over the next couple of months. Okay, so thank you so much for participating. And to find out more about the resources discussed today, please speak to your sales representative or visit cambridge.org forward slash education. Thank you very much, everyone who's helped today. And thank you so much, Lizzie, for such a fantastic presentation. Thank you all. Good luck with your teaching and goodbye.